here as a support for an egalitarian politics, but rather in tension with it. There must of necessity be an inside and an outside, the inside including those one has been able to construct friendships with, and the outside consisting in everyone else. It would seem difficult to build an egalitarian politics on such a basis. If what were required of an egalitarian politics were that everyone in it became friends, friendship would surely be an unpromising basis for politics. What I have argued here, however, is not that everyone in a political movement must become friends, but rather that friendship offers particular tools, and perhaps essential tools, for forming egalitarian political movements. In particular, I have claimed three political virtues for friendship. It offers a model of egalitarian relationships that resist the figures of neoliberalism. It trains people in such egalitarian interaction. And it motivates people to have healthier interaction with others. These virtues can be prized apart from friendship, either individually or collectively, and utilized in relationships that are not themselves friendships. It is possible to interact with others without thinking of them as either investments or objects of consumption, and yet without <coughs> developing deep and close friendships with them. It is possible to learn to consider others as equals without holding them, having, having them to be friends. And it is possible to maintain that consideration without ever turning into friendship. Moreover, all of this can be done with numerous others. It does not require the time and emotional engagement characteristic of a meaningful friendship. What it does require is a commitment to move beyond the parameters of interpersonal interaction that neoliberalism has prescribed for us. More deeply than the question of numbers, however, Derrida argues that the friend-enemy distinction is one that has porous borders. Friend becoming enemy, and an enemy becoming friend, or better, friendship becoming enmity, and enmity becoming friendship. Quote, the two concepts, friend-enemy, consequently intersect and ceaselessly change places, end quote. However, as with all journey and deconstructions, while the terms pass into each other, they are never entirely effaced. If this is true, then the use of friendship to ground the equality of anyone and everyone is a project doomed to failure. There will always be others, even intimate others, who are outside the thematic of friendship we have canvassed here, and thus beyond the capacity to be treated entirely as equals, as Rancio would have. Or better, since they would not be entirely beyond that capacity either, we might say more precisely, they would never be entirely on this side of it. I do not want to claim here that friendship even friendship strongly characterized by the themes you have described here, is immune to its outside, that is, to some form of enmity. My reasons for reserve here, however, are not Derridian. In a society where entrepreneurship and consumerism are everywhere pressed upon us, it is unlikely that we can escape their influence, even in our best relationships. My agreement with Derrida in this matter, then, is not on the basis of deconstruction, but rather on the basis of history and context. The question is whether this agreement undercuts the role friendship can play in political solidarity. I believe that it does not. As with my response to the earlier Derridian objection, there is no need to envision a pure friendship in order to envision friendship. Friendship in its non-economic mode presses against the figures of neoliberalism and in doing so, presses against neoliberalism itself. It is one thing to admit that this pressing is not pure, that is surrounded and at times infused by that against which it presses. It is quite another to seek to deconstruct it on that basis. To do the latter is to erase the distinction between the figure of friendship and that of neoliberalism, an erasure that would redound only to the benefit of neoliberalism itself. Derrida, of course, would not want to accept that neoliberalism would be the beneficiary of his deconstruction of friendship. In his view, the deconstruction leads not to an embrace of neoliberalism, but rather to a recognition of democracy as always democracy to come. As he tells us in Rhodes, quote, that to come not only points to the promise, but suggests that a democracy will never exist in the sense of a present existence. Not because it will be deferred, but because it will always remain apparatic in its structure, end quote. What he commends in a deconstruction of the friend-enemy distinction is not an apathy or a yielding to current political relationships, but instead an effacing of the border between friend and enemy that will allow a hospitality to the other to emerge. For Derrida, solidarity is created not through the cultivation of friendship, but rather through the deconstruction of the borders between the same of friendship and the other of enmity. This would open a space for a recognition of the other that would seem particularly relevant in light of current movements of exclusion 
of homosexuals, immigrants, etc. Such a space would not be entirely one of differences, nor entirely of identical equals. It would instead be a space of the economy between the two. As he writes in Politics of Friendship, quote, there is no democracy without respect for the irreducible singularity or alterity, but there is no democracy without the community of friends, without the calculation of majorities, without identifiable, stabilizable, representable subjects, all equal. These two laws are irreducible to each other, tragically irreconcilable and forever wounding. The wound itself opens with the necessity of having to count one's friends, to count the others, in the economy of one's own, there where every other is altogether other." End quote. What we have seen here, then, is a confrontation of two models of solidarity. One is a worldly Ranciarian model that seeks in friendship one of the models for solidarity, and the other a Derridian one that seeks instead to efface the borders between friendship and enmity. From the perspective of the latter, the former risks excluding others from whatever solidarity is claimed, and thus undercutting the egalitarianism upon which it is founded. What is required from that perspective is an embrace of a more messianic view, uh, view of democratic solidarity, one that resists bringing to full presence the character, nature, or basis of that solidarity if it wishes to remain democratic. Or from a different angle, the requirement is to hold together self and other in an unending, quote, tragic confrontation. There are, I believe, at least two things that can be said in response to the Derridian perspective, one in defense of Ranciere's view and another in the criticism of the Derridian alternative. As for the former, the history of nonviolent struggle and teaching suggests that the building of internal solidarity does not require the exclusion of the other. To see the other as an adversary is not to see them necessarily as less than equal or as prohibited in principle from the group to which one belongs. Trouble begins not when there is resistance, but when that resistance hypostasizes the other into a capital O other, an enemy or a force that must be destroyed or dismantled in order for one to move forward. It is this idea that Martin Luther King captures in a Christian vein when he writes that the doctrine of nonviolent action, quote, is, was not a doctrine that made their followers yearn for revenge, but one that called upon them to champion change. It was not a doctrine that asks an eye for an eye, but one that summoned men to seek to open the eyes of blind prejudice. The Negro, and this is uh, King writing in the uh, early 60s, the Negro turned his back on force not only because he knew he could not win his freedom through physical force, but also because he believed that through physical force he could lose his soul, end quote. Those who subscribe to Derrida's view might quickly and accurately point out that the adversaries addressed by Arancier and view are not the others whom Derrida seeks excluded from participation. This is true, and it's precisely what leads to my second criticism of Derrida's perspective. The deconstruction of view addresses those who are the beneficiaries of inequality, those who see themselves among the included rather than the excluded. His discourse seeks to discover and create pores in the border of the self-perceived uh, uh, self included might have erected between themselves and those they exclude. Rancio's view, alternatively, is addressed in the first place to the excluded. It is a framework of solidarity with those who seek to struggle, not uh, for the, uh, those against whom one's struggle might be directed. And given the dominance of the figures of neoliberalism we have canvassed, the kinds of friendships we outlined here is on the side of the excluded rather than the included. Derrida's deconstruction concerns friendship as a movement of internal cohesion among those who would keep at bay what Rancière calls the part that has no part. In a neoliberal world, friendship as a movement of internal cohesion can only be one of fresh investment and consumption. At its most cohesive, friendship would be a mutual investment in a collective organization whose goal is to ensure the dominance of those who already have a part. There's no place for friendship's uh, 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 contribution to solidarity, because such friendship can only be threatened to the neoliberal order for reasons we have seen. Thus, the possibilities of friendship that we have outlined here are not properly the subject of deconstruction, but if anything, a part of the other that is to have space open for it by deconstruction. In attempting to deconstruct friendship, then, Derrida is looking through the wrong end of the telescope. In the name of opening space for the other, he deconstructs one of the social tools by which that space can be opened. The reason he does this is that his discourse, by addressing itself to those who have a part rather than those who lack it, 
sees friendship only through the eyes of those for whom solidarity is a threat rather than a promise. There is, of course, much more to be said about the relationship of friendship to our current political order. My suggestion here is that Foucault's quick remark about homosexual friendship offering a challenge to current social arrangements is apt, and apt not only with regard to homosexual friendship. Moreover, friendship can be seen as a model for and a form of and a cultivation of political solidarity. If we can find ways to bring elements of some of the most significant relationships of our lives into the larger social, economic, and political arena, then perhaps we can, to one extent or another, echo the current slogan of so many progressive political movements and say that another world is possible. In fact, if we look in the right place, we will see that it is often already here. Thank you.